yes uh, so as you have noticed uh, you know like second peter uh, once again with a lot of practical advice um, so it is easy for us to follow um, so yeah so far we've seen paul peter's encouragement and then uh, towards the end of what he's saying he is emphasizing on the fact that god is true to his word and the prophetic word will you know surely come to pass so be strong in god and uh, you know continue to follow him so that's the way in which he's talking and he asks the believers to uh, you know continue to uh, live an honorable life a holy life and partake of the divine nature of god so we finished verse 19 again now verse uh, 20 and 21 that's also about prophecy you can learn so much about prophecy from just these three verses so here he says knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation okay so that simply says that prophecy is speaking the mind of god it's not people's opinions people's uh, um, interpretation people's suggestions that's not what prophecy so true prophecy genuine prophecy what is it it is the mind of god which is being spoken you know when god says <clears throat> that okay i am going to uh, uh, you know call I, i am going to lead you in the ministry or uh, this is what i am going to do in your life that you will um, serve me in such as in such a country so there are so many words that are spoken as prophecy isn't it so genuine prophecy is um, from god but are there false prophecies there could be now that is not what we are referring to but genuine prophecy is always something that god has spoken and that is why he says scripture no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation and so you see prophecy has no private uh, interpretation similarly he says prophecy of scripture so in one sense when we study the word of god you know it is prophetic god's word itself is prophetic and the meaning of what is in the word of god we have to search the meaning the right meaning and that is why you know paul puts it like you rightly divide the word of god so we can you know anyone can read the bible you also have people like you know scientists historians archaeologists different people who have read the bible and come up with all kinds of interpretation now what is that that is human interpretation but that's not exactly what the bible says for us to understand the bible you know we really need the mind of god and you you also see in this particular verse that no prophecy of scripture so god's word is prophetic it carries the mind of god then for prophecy never came by the will of man again you know we are being told that the origin of prophecy is what god is the origin of prophecy but holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit so moved by the holy spirit refers to the inspiration of the holy spirit so again you know that gives us so much clarity about how one prophesies one cannot prophesy without the inspiration of the holy spirit so whatever has been recorded even you know he says holy men of god that means in the old testament there are so many prophecies isn't it by uh, isaiah jeremiah ezekiel how did they prophesy they were moved or influenced uh, inspired by the holy spirit now coming to chapter 2 here now chapter 2 and a little bit of chapter 3 you will notice that he is very directly addressing people who uh, are uh, dangerous okay uh, these are the ones that the believers must be careful about so starting from verse 1 here he says but there were also false prophets so till now he said like true prophecy comes from god there are also false prophets so what is it false prophets remember when we studied prophecy we said that uh, like uh, people who prophesy of their own minds 
God said that they deceive you. They who, who speak of their own minds, they deceive you. So such are false prophets among the people. Even as they were, there will be false teachers among you. So now he is saying that uh, you understand to the people. He's saying you understand who false prophets are. They don't present the mind of God to us. And similarly, similarly, he talks of another category. And notice that category. False teachers. False teachers. When we studied about prophecy, we said that true prophecy, one is it is from God, it speaks the mind of God, it edifies, exhorts, comforts the believers, um, then it draws us closer to God. You remember, uh, it, it needs to cause us to worship God. And also uh, the, the prophecy, it is through the work of the Holy Spirit, but it is in alignment to, with the word of God because the spirit and the word agree, 1 John 5, 7. And so all these are features of genuine and true prophetic word. However, the opposite of that is what? False prophecy. False prophecy is not from God. It is from the mind of man and it will not draw us close to God, but it will take us away from God. And it does not agree with the word of God. So these are all features of false prophecy. Similarly, when we look at false teachers, what will happen if we listen and if we, up, when, if we uh, you know, receive the false teaching? It will have its ill effects. We will definitely go far away from the truth of God's word and it will not help us worship and honor God. So that is the danger and that's what he's telling the people. Now you know that there were false prophets among people but there will also be false teachers who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Okay so this is again something for us to notice. He says secretly. How can this happen? You know, it is said that uh, anyone can make the Bible say what they want by interpreting it wrongly. Now, just I'm just giving an example. Let's say there is a parent who is very uh, rough and rude and abusive to the children. Uh, this parent might keep saying, you know, the Bible says, obey your father and mother, obey your father and mother. Is, is that correct? Yes, it is correct. It, is it there in the Bible? It is there in the Bible. But then, you know, the Bible also says that don't provoke your children. Fathers, don't provoke your children. So there is a context. There is a balance. There is the truth of God's word, which must be applied in its wholeness, in its fullness. So if somebody just takes one verse and tries to make a doctrine out of it and ignores all the other instructions, it's out of balance. Okay, so here he says, secretly bring in destructive heresies. It says secretly because in the beginning, it might sound like the truth. We might listen to some teachings that it might feel so good. Yeah, no, it is there in the Bible. Yeah, the Bible says this verse, this passage, it says, it is there. So you see, even for somebody who knows God's word, it might be difficult for us to identify the false teaching unless we continue to be diligent. Okay. So that is why he's saying that will be false teachers and they will secretly bring in and obviously, false teachers will not teach us something that will uh, help us partake of the divine nature of God or fulfill God's purpose. No, it will be the opposite. So he uses the term uh, destructive heresies. Heresies are uh, teachings that go against God. Let me just give you the exact uh, word over here for heresies. Yeah, so heresies, uh, the Greek word here is 
harasses and it means uh, disunion disunion or disjointed you know when uh, something doesn't connect when something doesn't make sense uh, so you kind of recognize that hey something is wrong here so it's a teaching that does not agree with god's word and that's what he's saying that is the job of the false teachers they will secretly bring in destructive heresies and which is why whenever we hear a teaching we have to we have to really study you remember the barians in the in the word of god barians were the ones who uh, heard the teaching of paul but the bible says that they went back and they searched the scriptures okay so they referred and saw hey, is it really like this in act 17 is where we read about the barians they were fair minded believers so in the same way today there are a lot of new teachings you know you open youtube uh, podcast new 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 teachings but we have to go back to the word and check because false teachings have this tendency secretly it sounds very nice but bring in destructive heresies it is disjointed it's not connected to the word of god though it looks like it is associated with the word of god okay let's move on even denying the lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction you see sometimes it's very clear cut what is uh, so there might be the denying of jesus also and we know that you know many uh, cults have that feature isn't it they don't acknowledge that the lord jesus is the son of god they don't acknowledge that uh, he is the savior of the world they don't acknowledge that uh, we are redeemed by the the um, finished work of the cross they deny these core realities of scripture and peter is warning the people he says see there will be false teachers they will secretly bring in destructive heresies and some will even deny what jesus has done okay uh, and, and remember even when we talked about uh, um, uh, apostle john during his times there were people who said okay you know jesus could be god but he is not fully man so whenever you contend with some truth about christ you're trying to prove that he is not the fulfillment of god's promise of sending the savior to the world okay and thereby saying that the gospel is not true so as believers we have to be very careful any such teaching you know be alert so that is why here uh, chapter 2 chapter 3 is warning be careful and bring on themselves swift destruction okay so he says that they bring destructive teaching they also are destroyed by what they are teaching and he says verse 2 many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed so unfortunate isn't it that uh, there are followers of cultic teachings and you know so many uh, things that are going on around us so, and but in all that is what destruction you don't really enjoy the truth of god's word and it's uh, what it produces uh, and also he says uh, the way of truth will be blasphemed uh, blaspheme okay what is that word i'll just tell you what it is in the greek uh, basically you see uh, it says spoken evil of so even the truth of god's word will be spoken evil of because of such false teachers and their destructive teachings now let's move on verse 3 he says by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words for a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber so he is focusing on the activity of false teachers and he says that what how what do they talk see opposite of truth is lies okay deception falls in that category so they are speaking lies why are they speaking lies he says 
covetousness meaning their agenda or motivation is not the equipping of god's people now what, what is the motivation of teaching what is the motivation of teaching anybody what do you get out of teaching people god's word what is the goal of teaching okay very nice so they were saying be mature in christ develop very good very good you know can we say equip god's people strengthen edify mm, all these things you know which are so positive okay uh, and we are becoming uh, when people are taught we learn and we become more like jesus so that is the motivation but you see the motivation of the false teacher covetousness to exploit it says so they have an agenda what is that agenda it is a very selfish agenda where they want to get what does not rightfully belong to them okay but what others have you know it could be money it could be privileges it could be benefits it could be things of pleasure so what they want to do is they want to appear like hey i am teaching you this nice truth but they are actually waiting to exploit can i get some kind of a uh, um, you know benefit out of this so that's what he's saying by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words lies they are speaking lies for a long time their judgment has been idle and their destruction does not slumber so he's also saying that they don't have the capacity to analyze or understand so you see when for a, for a long time you don't respond to the conviction of the holy spirit what happens hardness isn't it hardness of heart no ability to perceive the voice of god these things happen so he's saying that the false teacher has come to a place where there is no more judgment no correct judgment you know lost the ability to understand uh, it has been idle their mind has been idle and their destruction does not slumber or if you look at their life you will see that it's not godly okay uh, and, and their destruction does not slumber is also to say that uh, they will also face the consequences of their teaching because every teaching has a result it has a result either i build up people or i lead them in the wrong path and i give them destruction so he's saying that surely there is going to be a result which they themselves will also face now verse 4 for if god did not spare the angels who sin now this is very interesting please pay attention uh, if we understand this portion the book of jude which is only one chapter it's kind of a repetition of this uh, first peter chapter 2 so uh, i mean some of the truths here will just carry on so it will be easy for us to uh, touch on uh, jude okay so he says that god is a god of justice and truth he will not keep quiet when uh, there is uh, false teaching going on so that's what uh, he is trying to uh, suggest here so from verse 4 he says for if god did not spare the angels who sinned who are the angels who sinned no, we'll come to that but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world but saved noah one of eight people a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of sodom and gomorrah into ashes condemned them to destruction making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly okay so you see three kind of scenarios he says god did not spare the angels who sinned that is one two is did not spare the ancient world during noah's time that is two three is he says 
cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, that is three. So we see the judgment, so judgment of God come upon disobedience. So the first category, angels who sinned, if you recall, you know, you have this uh, uh, whole thing of, uh, you know, uh, say Lucifer, Lucifer uh, fell from heaven, cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness. So you see Satan and his angels, one third of the angels, right, they have uh, been cast out of heaven and a part of those angels have already been punished uh, as prisoners. So that is what this scripture says. They were disobedient to God. So they are in hell, delivered them into chains of darkness. So we can also call them demons. Who are they? They are nothing but fallen angels. Some of them are in hell, in the prison. But some of them are on the earth. They are the demons whom we cast out of people. And, you know, we, we uh, um, engage in spiritual warfare against spiritual you know, principalities, powers of darkness and all that. So we understand who, who these demons are. They are basically fallen angels. Now, some of them have already come under judgment and they are in uh, hell as prisoners. Now, all the demons are going to be judged. And that is towards the uh, end of end of uh, uh, the world. So that's also going to happen. Now, second one is Noah. Remember, at the time of Noah, we see that uh, uh, that the world was filled with sin, and God was so sad about the world. It was corrupt. It was very very corrupt. And so God chose a family, Noah, uh, and uh, you know his his uh, children, and God asked him to build an ark and the world was destroyed with the flood. So what is this destroyed with the flood? God's judgment for unrighteousness and sin, which happened. Now, third is Sodom and Gomorrah. If you go back, Abraham's life, we notice there that you know, there were these cities filled with sin. Now, Abraham tried to intercede for these cities and still, because they were so uh, sinful that God brought destruction on them. You know, they, they were destroyed uh, with, with fire. So in such a manner, God's judgment has always come upon unrighteousness. So basically he's saying our God is a just God. He will notice the wrong and there is a punishment for the wrong. So now how can these false teachers think that they can get away with false teaching? So destruction will come. Verse 7, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Uh, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So, you know, just in continuation with Sodom and Gomorrah's uh, 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 incident, Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And you know, Lot was, the Bible says, uh, righteous. So here, uh, Lot is spoken of as a righteous man. You know, when you see sin happening around you, it's upsetting, isn't it? We hear every day news. Uh, I remember the other day we put the TV on and we were listening to news after news after news. Nothing was encouraging. You know, war is happening. Uh, this uh, Some uh, political fights are happening. This is happening. So it's, it's so upsetting when we see sin around us. So you imagine Lot, he was in a time and in a city where uh, we know, you, you know, people were engaging in uh, sexual immorality. Uh, and even he and his family was also vulnerable to these things. And the Bible says that, you know, he was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. And that is how a righteous person should be. We should be upset. We should be uh, angry. We should be um, not in a negative way that we end up using our anger uh, uh, you know in in um, bad ways that's not how it is but a righteous person is upset and angry it's a righteous anger where we think okay god you know what can i do 
to see a change so that is how a righteous person should be so righteous lot he was very upset by all these things but then you know god delivered god delivered him uh, and you know peter is trying to say that we serve a god who is watching everything when there is oppression he also knows how to deliver his people but he also knows how to judge the ungodly or the wicked people you know that brings us so much of comfort isn't it when we when sometimes we have the question that god how uh, i think you don't you don't care or lord where is where is the justice there's so much of wickedness people uh, are experiencing uh, injustice you know in various ways but then we see that surely god will uh respond he's not a god who closes his eyes and says yeah okay no problem you can do whatever you want so basically he's warning the believers and he's saying look be alert we have a god who is watching everything he knows how to deliver the righteous but he also knows how to punish the wicked so verse 10 and he says and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority so you know he's saying here that uh god will judge god will judge uh he will judge those who walk according to the flesh so what is according to the flesh you see it's enmity against god it will be opposite to what god desires so we are doing the things that the flesh desires in the lust of uncleanness you know these are all terms that uh, describe um you know wrong living wrong living uh, wrong priorities uh, wrong desires and things like that you know you give in to the fleshly desires and he is showing us that false teachers earlier he said covetous exploit deceptive words destructive heresies now he is saying lust fl- flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority so when you look at people who are teaching false things you will see these characteristics you know they are living for their own pleasure and he also adds despise authority what did he teach in this previous episode you honor you submit to authorities not just to the kind and the uh, you know the the kind boss but you be submissive even to the harsh boss that's what he said so now he is saying that the false teachers they don't care they will despise or dishonor authorities okay so these are the characteristics of false teachers and it says they are presumptuous okay so what is presumptuous i'll i'll tell you exactly from the greek here yeah presumptuous so presumptuous comes from tolmetes <laughs> it says uh, uh daring you know it really takes a lot of self dependence and pride to interpret things however you like because that is presumptuous we say don't be presumptuous or you carefully study and then you say what you want to say because we have the fear of god isn't it we should not say or teach something which is not there in god's word but what about a false teacher presumptuous very daring yeah i'll say whatever i want to say so that is also a characteristic of a false teacher he says self willed again fleshly they want to do what they want to do more characteristics he adds he says they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries okay. now basically he is saying that they uh, like to speak evil who are dignitaries dignitaries are uh, the term here in uh, uh, greek is doxa and doxa has to do with glory okay so glory uh, we could understand this as heavenly beings heavenly beings or those who have the glory 
right? Uh, uh, that God has given them. So of heavenly beings also they speak evil. So such are the false teachers. Uh, and whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. So he's talking about a, a discipline and an, and an honor which is there in the structure of God's kingdom. You see that false teachers easily they speak evil of even heavenly beings. Whereas heavenly beings themselves. So he mentions angels. Angels are so powerful, right? There are many categories of angels. There are warning angels, messenger angels, um, what else? Yeah, so, you know, all kinds of angels are there. When we think of such angels, you know, like uh, you have a Michael fighting in the, in the uh, you know, in uh, fighting the prince of Persia and Greece. So they are mighty creatures. But still, such creatures, what does it say? They don't speak evil of dignitaries because there is a discipline. You know, if you look at the army or the navy or uh, uh, such uh, organizations, there is a lot of discipline. You will see how they speak uh, with one another, even if they have to bring an accusation against a senior in the in the uh, of in in the hierarchy, there is a way in which they have to do it. You know, they can't just tell the commanding officer, "Oh, I don't like you. You are wrong." That's not an honourable way of doing it. So there is a discipline, there is an honor which is maintained in that hierarchy. Similarly, when you look at heavenly beings, they carry that honor. They don't speak evil about each other. But what do false teachers do? They are ready to speak evil even of doxa or heavenly beings. So that is all very dangerous. We should not uh, be doing such things. Then uh, he adds to that, you know, they speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. So things are done in an honorable way in the kingdom of God. Verse 12, but these, meaning the false teachers, like natural brute beasts. So basically he's kind of associate, you know, giving the um, idea that they are like wild animals. Can you control wild animals? Can you tame wild animals? No. When when there is a wild animal that is destroying, the only way that you know people try to uh, work with such a thing is they might put one tranquilizer injection. No, they they put a tranquilizer, calm it down, and then okay, that wild animal needs some medical treatment, something they will do. But before it comes back to its consciousness, because when it is conscious, you can't tame it. And in the same way, he's saying, let's see, false teachers are like this. You can't control them. They behave like wild animals made to be caught and destroyed. They speak evil of the things that they do not understand. So they don't have depth of understanding. Just random, you know, from the surface, saying whatever they like to say. And he says the quality uh, of their life, it says, and will perish, utterly perish in their own corruption. See, they are not living a righteous life. They're not teaching the right thing. So their life will be uh, perishing in, in their own corruption. And people who follow what they are teaching, they will also be destroyed and will receive the wages of unrighteousness. Okay. So obviously, there is consequences, isn't it? Whether right living or wrong living. So each one will reap of the consequences. Uh, they will receive the wages of unrighteousness or the results of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. So uh, basically he says, you know, uh, going for pleasure in the daytime, that's that's not a, a mature thing to do. Uh, okay. Uh, so he says, see, these people... Ha, don't have any self-control. They want their own pleasure all the time. That's the way it's understood. So they're only bothered about one person. Who is that one person? They. Okay, so these are the features of a false teacher. So be careful. Now, he adds to it. He adds more features to uh, what these false teachers are like. Verse 13, 
you know, that second part there, he says, they are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. Okay, so spots and blemishes is, uh, see, it's like unholy. We're not, we're not, uh, it doesn't bring honor, it doesn't bring glory to God. Uh, and, you know, they continue with their lies, okay, uh, while they feast with you. So meaning, uh, in those times, they would have had gatherings uh, or, or, and, uh, you know, so the sense of community, you have these people with you. Okay, so the false teachers are uh, literally a part of the community. They behave like they are with you. Okay, however, they are very much inclined to the flesh. So he says, having eyes full of adultery, again, fleshly behavior, and that cannot cease from sin, fleshly attitude, enticing unstable souls. So see, a false teacher will also kind of have an idea, oh, these people are not strong in the word. Come on, let me teach them. So sometimes they will even look for the weak ones uh, among the uh, people. So this is the attitude which they carry. They have a heart trained in covetous practices. Okay, again, fleshly behavior and are accursed children. Accursed children is, you know, they, they're, they're not like uh, uh, honorable. They're not honorable. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the Bo son of Boer. What did Balaam do? He was ready to prophesy for money. How can you do God's work? You know that God is watching. So what does it tell us about Balaam? No fear of God. Using the gift of God for personal benefit. That's so dangerous, isn't it? So he's saying false teachers are like that. Teaching what? The word of God, but for personal benefit. So please don't be like Balaam. He was a false prophet uh, uh, or rather a prophet for benefit. And in the same way, you know, these false teachers are for their own benefit. Uh, and he reminds them, you know, Balaam, he loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. Okay, do you remember that? The donkey was the one that uh, really stopped this prophet. So he says, these false teachers, these are wells without water. So that's very interesting. See, a well without water, it's not useful for us, isn't it? We need, we ex when we think well, there's got to be water in it. What does water do? It quenches our thirst. It refreshes us. It, you know, uh, uh, nurtures our body. God's word is like that. It will bring life, it will bring strength, it will bring refreshing. But when we are listening to false teaching, there is nothing there. It sounds nice. Okay, and uh, I mean, I, I have heard so many uh, initially, right? When I was learning about God's word, I've heard many teachings. And then I have wondered, uh, you know, whether uh, these things are true. Like, I'll just give you one simple example. I don't want to you know, bring up uh, these matters here. Uh, but then, you know, there, there was uh, one particular teaching I heard where somebody was saying that uh, a human being should only survive on, uh, you know, Jesus said that uh, Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, okay, but by the word of God. So this person has a teaching in which he says that uh, you should not eat food. Okay, if you if you are a believer who is very spiritual, you should be able to eat only communion and live. And so this person also kind of uh, shares that uh, you know uh, I have been living only on communion for such a long time. So like when I heard that, it sounded so nice. It sounded very nice to me. I was like, wow, that must be amazing to really live only on communion and food is not necessary. But then when I kind of studied God's word, yes, that verse is there in the Bible, but 
Bible doesn't say that, you know, if I'm a true believer, I should only live on communion. And there is some kind of a spiritual reality that I will hit, you know, if I practice these. Things. So you see, it's like that. It's kind of subtle, but it feels like it's already there in the Bible. But if you follow a teaching like that, imagine, you know, there will be so much of condemnation for people who are eating food. We would think that... Uh, I'm not able to be like my pastor who's only eating communion and who's only able to survive on communion. And moreover, does the scripture, it is a one-off verse. You just take one verse. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You can't make a doctrine out of a single verse. Isn't it? You have to have many passages of scripture saying the same thing. Then that's a doctrine. So, False teachers are like that. You know, there is a whole lot of such things. So when I, where is the strength in this? Where is the nourishing in this? You know, how does it help me uh, live, fulfill God's purpose for my life? So wells without water, where you feel like I'm not getting anything out of this to live for God. That is false teaching. So we have to be careful. He says, clouds carried by a tempest for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So, you know, we again, we expect if when we see clouds, we are happy that, wow, you know, it's going to rain. Uh, it's going to refresh us after such a long uh, spell of heat. But clouds carried by tempest is, uh, you know, when you have these destructive uh, um, uh, tsunami kind of situations where when you see the tempest clouds, you're scared of it. You're like, oh no, it's only going to pour down water in a violent way to destroy the property there. So if you want to all, uh, if you want to sum it up, false teachers are self-willed, they're living for themselves, they have wrong motivation, and their teaching does not edify the body of Christ. Okay. So that is it. That's the bottom line. That teaching is destructive. It does not edify the body of Christ. And he has explained it with so much of example. Little more is there. Verse 18, he says, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. So again, it's very clear. Fleshly, empty words. They themselves have no overcoming capacity. Right? So if there's no self-control, remember earlier for maturity, what did he say? To your faith, you add virtue to virtue. You add knowledge to knowledge. You add self-control to self-control. You add brotherly. So maturity looks like that but in this case the false teacher himself is not able to practice the truth of god's word so then you know there is corruption in their own personal life or in other words he uses the word bondage they are living in they are slaves of corruption you know they are living in bondage and what do they do they promise liberty to us but then their teaching only brings um, you know, it, it, it puts us in, in a difficult place. So verse 20, he says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. You know, it's like Hebrews 6. And notice, you know, he's talking about false teachers who are born again, originally born again. Okay, so... Are they part of the family of God? Yes. But because they have followed this fleshly lifestyle and uh, not been honoring of God's word, what has happened to them? They have fallen into error and they are also teaching error. That's why Paul told Timothy, take heed to the, uh, uh, you know, take heed to the doctrine. So be careful, be careful, never forget what you learned uh, in uh, first standard. You know, if we forget what we learned in first standard, A, B, C, D, we can't read. Today we are reading, you know, books and all that. But if we forget what we learned in first standard, we can't. So in the same way, he's talking about those believers, 
born again people who have lived in their own ways and he says they are polluted by the world uh, and uh, uh, entangled in them uh, and you see they are the it's like what hebrew six has fallen away fallen away and he's warning he's saying the latter end is worse for them than the beginning so such people will have a destructive end for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them but it has happened to them according to the not according to the true proverb a dog returns to its own vomit and a so having washed to her wallowing in the mire so basically he says that you know it's really sad that uh, such people are uh, they have fallen away and uh, they know the truth but they have rejected the truth okay now let's quickly come to um, chapter 3 here so once again he comes and he says i'm here to remind you uh, i stir up your pure minds by way of reminder so he's reminding them that you know be careful about these things that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles of the lord and savior remember i told you apostles are very careful about the doctrine so he says never let go of the doctrine we have learned till now what we have learned don't let some new teaching come in and mess it up so we have to be careful isn't it so doctrine is so so crucial verse 3 knowing this first that scoffers will come in the last days so scoffers are you know people who um, laugh at the truth they laugh at the truth so he says in the last days there will be people who say he says uh, where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation so he's saying you know it's like again there are people who will question the truth of god's word we keep saying that oh jesus is coming back soon soon what soon you know so many generations have come and gone jesus never came so he's not going to come so people who question and mock the truth of god's word such people will be there and then verse seven he says for this they willfully forget that by the word of god the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men so he's saying see the people who make fun of the word that christ is going to come back don't forget that it is the word of god through which the world was created it is the word of god that sustains the world and it is the word of god which is going to be fulfilled so he says that there will come a time the end of the earth where there will be judgment there will be uh, also the um um sort of you know destruction of the world with fire we we have all done eschatology so we know the sequence of things he's not referring to the sequence here but he's just putting it in a general way and saying that what god has spoken it has come to pass it will come to pass so how you know how what a daring thing to make fun of the truth of god's word so we should never uh, really uh, dishonor god's word in that way okay so a little more of uh, chapter 3 to go uh, i'll touch on that in the next class and we will also complete jude it's only one chapter so we'll we'll finish that in the next class and we'll start off james um, uh, and we should be able to complete your course uh, you know thoroughly okay so let's pray and close now i just want to request somebody to pray kiran can you pray yes ma'am sir go ahead we'll pray father god we come before you throne one second we want to say thanking you father god to all your goodness and faithfulness and mercy father god 
thanking you for the good for your understanding and that your knowledge and your revelation and all your promises for the good thanking you thanking you for the good for the journey for the good that you leading us for the good thanking you thanking you for the good for the subject and thanking you for the healing understand me about the to the book of peace for the good thanking you so many revelation you just see today for the good thanking you rest of the day submitting to your hand take care of every side for the good thanking you Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you, everyone. God bless. We'll meet again uh, next Monday. Okay. Have a good week. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, ma'am.